Today's interview is brought to you by Van Eck, a global leader in asset management since 1955. You'll be hearing more about Van Eck's income-focused ETFs later on, but for now, let's get into today's interview. I am very pleased to welcome to Forward Guidance, Michael Pettis, professor of finance at Peking University and senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment. Michael is an expert on China, and I want to ask him, why has China been growing so strongly over the past 30 years? And why does he think that what is going to come, China's growth is going to slow down uh, dramatically? Michael, it's great to have you here. Can you start off by describing the Chinese growth model? Sure. The uh, the Chinese growth model is not particularly Chinese. Um, lots of countries have followed this growth model. Um, you could argue that, you know, you can trace its development way back to the 1830s in the U.S. so-called American system. It shares some uh, some characteristics with that. But really, the modern version of this model uh, developed with uh, Germany and the Soviet Union in the 1930s. And a number of countries since the Second World War have followed this model. Japan, for example, Brazil in the 1950s and 60s, and, and, and at least two dozen other countries. And what really characterizes this model, you know, some people say that, that, that China follows an export-driven model, and that's not really correct. Uh, high exports and a high trade surplus, more importantly, are res residual effects of this model, but this is really an investment model, an investment-driven model. And the way the model works is you put into place structures that drive very high levels of investment. Now, in developing countries where savings tend to be quite low because income is low, um, it's very difficult to have investment-driven models unless either you import a lot of foreign savings so, for example, that's what the United States did in the 19th century. It imported a lot of savings from England and from the Netherlands to drive up its investment rate. Uh, or you have to push up savings domestically. And because there has been a perception ever since the 1970s that relying on foreign savings is very risky. Remember, that's what happened to Latin America in the 1960s and 70s, leading to the big uh, crisis of the 1980s. The argument is that you should force up the domestic savings rate. Now, there's really no trick to forcing up the domestic savings rate. Conceptually, it's quite easy to explain how to do that. Uh, all GDP is either consumed or not consumed, which means saved. And so the way you force up the domestic savings rate is to take income away from groups that consume, from that sector of the economy that consumes, and pass it on to that sector or those sectors of the economy that don't consume. So basically, you know, you can divide economy, the economy in many different ways, but you can separate it into rich people, ordinary people, businesses, and government. And out of those four sectors, the only uh, sector that consumes most of it, most of its income, is ordinary people. So in a process in where you shift income away from ordinary people towards businesses, towards government, towards the rich, you automatically reduce the consumption share of GDP and force up the savings share. And in the case of China, they did that. Um, in the 1980s, their consumption share was, was sort of normal uh, for most countries. And over the next uh, 15, 20 years, they drove the consumption share of GDP to the lowest ever seen in history, which also means the saving share was the highest ever seen in history. Now, is this a good model or a bad model? Well, <clears throat> China entered the reform and opening up period hugely underinvested. It had gone through five decades of anti-Japanese war, civil war, and Maoism, and it was among the most underinvested countries, perhaps in history, for its level of development. And so what it really needed was to maximize investment. It had to invest in infrastructure. It had to invest in property. It had to invest in uh, manufacturing. It had to invest basically in everything. And so this model, which forced up the savings rate, concentrated the savings within the banking system, and then forced the banks to lend heavily into almost any type of investment you could think of, generated very, very rapid growth. 
the problem with this model, and every single country that's followed this model has run into this problem. This is not a particularly Chinese problem. The problem is that a successful development model is one that addresses your particular problems. And to the extent that it's successful, by definition, it resolves those problems. And so, ironically, a successful development model is one that makes itself obsolete. And when that happens, you need to shift the model. And, and, and in, in the case of China and other countries that followed the investment growth model, it becomes obsolete when the amount of investment it can absorb and the amount of investment it has converges. Once that happens, you can no longer generate rapid growth levels by investing in stuff that's needed for the economy. And then you have to worry more about the distribution of demand. And most demand globally is uh, consumption demand. Roughly 75% of demand in, in the global economy is, is consumption. Um, and it's consumption that drives, that tends to drive business investment because uh, businesses invest in order to satisfy the consumer needs of, of the population. So the problem in China is that with the household income share of GDP so low, and therefore the consumption share, once they maxed out in the, in, in, in the growth rate in investment, once they invested as much as they could productively absorb, the problem is where do you get demand? And there's only three sources of demand, investment, uh, the trade surplus or net exports, and, uh, and domestic consumption. And the problem is that China had way too much reliance on investment and not enough on consumption. So they have to bring up consumption as they bring investment down. And, and for reasons that I'm sure we'll discuss, that's really hard to do. And one of the consequences was an explosion in the Chinese trade surplus. Right. So China r runs a current account surplus, so they, they export more than they import. That, that can be a very good model. But the problem is that all of this excess savings uh, is running out of investment opportunities. Is, is that what you're saying? That in the 1990s, yeah. 2000s, okay, we're going to build subways, office buildings, and it's great. We're going to get a huge return on that for society, for, for everyone who, who builds it, because we, we need these things. But now you're saying there are enough subways, enough office buildings, and, and it, right. there's just is, is, is a problem with China too much money, too much savings? Because it seems a little paradoxical. You know, it seems savings. like a good problem to have. Yeah, it's way too much savings. And it's structurally embedded, right? It's not because people are thrifty. It's because the household share of income is quite low and there's no social safety net. So it's up to you to save for your retirement and in case you have a medical accident and, and all these other things. Now, you said running a trade surplus is a good thing, but I'd, I'd want to I'd want to caution you there. Trade surpluses are not good things. Trade surpluses really uh, represent very weak domestic demand. Um, exports are a good thing. And the purpose of exports is really to pay for imports. And if you're exporting a lot, but you're not converting that into a lot of imports, all that means is that domestic demand is very weak. Remember that your trade surplus, technically your current account surplus, but, but basically your trade surplus is equal to the excess of savings over investment. So the problem China has, it has a really high uh, savings rate. This was good when the investment rate was really high. But now, so much of that investment is non-productive, they want to bring it down. But as they bring it down, that creates a trade surplus, which creates a whole other set of problems. The rest of the world can't really absorb it. So they need to bring down investment, which is another way of, I'm sorry, bring down savings, which is another way of saying they need to raise consumption. But that's quite hard to do. The good way to do it is to redistribute income to ordinary people so that they can consume more. And then this way, the, the country saves less. But that's politically very tough to do. The bad way you can reduce savings is with much slower GDP growth. And that's what they're trying to avoid. Chinese leadership, at what point do you think they became aware of this issue, that there was an excess savings and more money than there was productive investment opportunities? I know China really you know, turned on the money printer, did a huge st stimulus for China as well as the world in 2008, 2009. Uh, but then I think gradually, is it, is it accurate to say that the Chinese Communist Party has become aware that uh, 
you know, real estate speculation maybe not so good a thing because they have been cracking down on that sector, right? Well, they became aware of this much earlier, as early as March uh, 2007. Um, uh, Premier, then Premier Wen Jiabao, gave a very famous speech called The Four Uns, China's unbalanced and, and un this and un that and un the other. And basically in that speech, uh, Wen, Wen recognized that consumption was too low of a share of GDP and promised that it would become one of the top economic priorities of Beijing to raise the consumption share of GDP. Now, that's not an easy thing to do. Japan has been talking about doing this since the Mayakawa report in 1986, and they haven't been able to do it. And to show how hard it is, after Wen gave that speech, the consumption share actually continued to decline for four or five years before it finally bottomed out and it's now starting to rise. But uh, what is it now, um, uh, 16 years later, we're more or less back to where we were in 2007 when Wen recognized how bad the consumption level was. It's very hard to change the consumption share of GDP. What is the leadership doing now in order to try and increase consumption? And is it the type of problem where if an entity that wanted to solve it and, and really focus on solving it, it could solve it, it's well, you're, you're exactly right. Um, it's a political issue. It's always a political issue. Uh, the reason we've always had these problems dating way back to the 1960s and 70s is because of political constraints. In fact, one of my favorite economists, uh, Albert Hirschman, uh, wrote about this way back in the 1970s. It's not a new problem. Uh, here's, here's the way I think about it, Jack. I mean, I, I think it really helps to think about it systemically, something that economists don't do enough. And that is, when you look at the total income produced by any economy, China or the US or anybody else, that income is divided into different groups. And one of the ways you can divide income, one of the, one of the ways you can divide the economy, as I said earlier, is ordinary people who consume most of their income, rich people who consume very little of their income, businesses who consume none of their income, and government, which you know, if it's a welfare state like in Scandinavia, a lot of their income is consumed. But if it's a country like China, supply side economy, almost none of it is consumed. So if you want consumption to go up, you have to transfer it to ordinary households. You have to transfer income. You have to give them a bigger share. That sounds great. Everyone's happy to get more. But by definition, a bigger share for me means a smaller share for you. And so the question is, who are you in this in this uh, in this case? And uh, uh, um, it could be the rich, but in China, <clears throat> China has a very unequal distribution of income. But the problem is not that the rich have too much. The rich have too much relative to ordinary Chinese. But the problem is that households have too little. So uh, transferring it from the rich, which is politically quite difficult, is not going to solve the problem. So who else? You can transfer it from businesses, but business are, you know, business is the, the engine of growth. And if you really penalize businesses, um, you may undermine long-term growth rates. In fact, you almost certainly will. Um, so that only leaves government. And in China, you know, there's not just one government. There's the central government in Beijing, but there are also very powerful provincial and local governments throughout the country. And they own a lot of assets. And for reasons which we can get into later, if you're interested, as you go through all of the various forms of transfers, the only real way to solve the problem in China is transfers from local governments. Now, that's easy to say, but you think the last 30 or 40 years, local governments have benefited from transfers in the opposite direction, right? Um, so a lot of Chinese growth has been built around huge spending by local governments subsidized by transfers into the local governments. And so the political, the business, the financial elites in each region or each province are really built around those, those transfers in. And now what we're saying is what we must do is reverse the transfers instead of receiving, instead of being on the receiving end of transfers, Local governments must now be on the delivering end of much larger transfers. And I would argue, and you know, this is uh, Hirschman's argument, uh, 
that that involves a really substantial change in the political, business, and financial institutions. It involves a change in the distribution of power. So it's easy to talk about as if it were just an economic issue, but ultimately it's not an economic issue. It's primarily a political issue. Right. And you know, people hear Chinese Communist Party, co- communist, you know, so- social equality, m- Marxism. Uh, h- how is it that you have all of these very wealthy uh, people who- whose savings are not being put to, to good use? Uh, and I-, I suppose, can you go-, can we go back to, was it Deng Xiaoping who said some some quote about, uh, you know, he kind of ch- changed the game. And, 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 and is that is the sort of welcoming of uh, entrepreneurialism and individuals becoming wealthy, is that changing somewhat? Uh, you know, now that you know, President Xi kind of, you know, for lack of a better word, kind of put Jack Ma in his place? Uh, maybe. Um, you know, I think, I think all this talk about communism and Marxism, it's the kind of things Americans like to say to scare ourselves. I don't think it's very helpful in understanding China. Um, China is the, 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 the model that China has followed has been followed by other countries, including Japan and, and Brazil in the 50s and 60s. And Brazil was a right wing military dictatorship. So I, I wouldn't use those really to describe what's happening. It's really a classic development model. Um, now, <clears throat> as part of common prosperity, there is talk about transferring money from the rich to the poor. But what I would argue is that common prosperity, which is the the phrase that we use for those transfers, is really an attempt to solve the American problem in China. So in the United States, we also have a terrible problem of income distribution. Um, I'm, I'm sure I don't need to tell you, but the share retained by the rich, we have to go back to the 1920s or the 1860s to see such a great distortion. Um, So if you want to solve the problem in the U.S., then what we have to do is redistribute wealth. Instead of distributing it from ordinary Americans to the rich, we have to reverse those transfers. Um, Will that solve the problem in the U.S.? Yes, because households account for about 80 percent of American GDP. Businesses, roughly 20 percent, and government is net zero or slightly negative. But that's not the case in China. In China, households retain around 60%. And businesses, let's call it 20%. It's hard to know where you draw the line between business and government, obviously. But roughly 20% in line with other economies. And the government retains 20%. Um, So it seems to me that in the U.S., redistributing wealth, or at least reversing the transfers from ordinary Americans to wealthy Americans would probably solve the problem of, of, of distorted income distribution in the U.S. But in China, it solves the minor problem. It doesn't really address the main problem. So, you know, there are a lot of political reasons for what's happened to Jack Ma and other very uh, 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 wealthy entrepreneurs. But I think as Americans, we probably overstate their importance. The real struggle mm. is the struggle between the central government and the local governments and between the, you know, the, the, the better off local governments and the much worse off local governments. So, Professor, how do you see this playing out? If over the past 30 years, China has had enormous economic growth, what do you see going forward and why? In, in the medium and long term, it's not so hard to make predictions simply because As I said, at least two dozen countries have followed this model, and very conveniently, they all do the same thing. Um, First, you have very rapid, healthy growth. In the the 1950s and 60s, Brazil was growing so rapidly that it was the first country that I can find to be called an economic miracle, and many other countries have done that, Japan right up until the 1970s and early 80s. Then you have a period a very rapid growth where suddenly debt explodes. Before that, debt was contained. And it's only after that that debt explodes. And that makes sense because if I borrow $100 and invest it productively, GDP should go up by more than $100. So my debt goes up, but GDP goes up by more. So it's not a problem. And debt rose very quickly in all of these countries, including China in the 1990s. It rose very rapidly. But we never talked about it because the debt ratio remained very low. Uh, 
And then something happened around 2006, 2007 that happened to every country that followed this model is suddenly the debt started growing more quickly and GDP growth started to slow down. So now we started to see a rapid rise in the debt to GDP ratio or whatever your favorite you know, measure of the debt burden is. You start to see it rise around that time. And that, uh, that sort of confirms the idea that investment is non-productive. Because again, if you borrow $100 and invest it in a project that only generates $60 worth of, of growth to the economy, then debt goes up by 100, but GDP goes up by 60. So your debt to GDP ratio starts to get worse. That's, like I said, happened in every country that followed this model. The third stage is the adjustment. And there, there's only been two types of adjustment in history. Uh, I would call them the American type and then the Japanese type. The American type, uh, which occurred in the 1930s, we saw obviously a terribly difficult adjustment in which GDP contracted by roughly 35% in the first three years of the decade. Household income contracted by only, quote unquote, half of that. It contracted by about 15, 20%. So you notice that the US rebalanced. It rebalanced in the form of a crisis and a contraction. Um, so that's one way countries, that's how Brazil rebalanced in the 1980s, et cetera. So it's one way you can readjust. The other way, the Japanese way, is you never have a crisis. What you end up having is a very long period in which GDP growth drops sharply and household income growth drops not as sharply. So in, in Japan, we went from GDP growth of 4 to 5% before 1990 to roughly half a percent after. But household income was below GDP growth before 1990 and above GDP growth after 1990, it was roughly one and a half percent. So then you never have a crisis, you never have the political and social pain of a crisis, but it seems that you have a much worse economic adjustment over the long term. Um, uh, uh, and, and the way I think about that is, you know, the two biggest crises of the last 100 years were probably the U.S. in the 30s and Japan after 1990. And the U.S. share of global GDP dropped by about 20 to 30 percent. But within a decade, it had grown right back up again and continued growing. Japan uh, in 1991 was about 17 percent of the world, which is where China is today. Uh, but 20 years later, it was around 7%, and it's never really recovered. So it lost about 60% of its share of global GDP. So if that's what happens, you know, if those are the options, I think China is more likely to follow the Japanese model. There's a third option. It's never happened in history, but in theory, it could happen. And that is if China could transfer about one to one and a half percent of GDP every year from local governments to the household sector, consumption could take off, maybe grow at six or seven percent and drag GDP growth behind it at around three and a half to four percent. That would be the really good case scenario. Uh, as I said, it's never happened and it's politically quite hard to pull it off. But at least in theory, that could happen. Right. So, Professor, uh, based on from, from the early 2000s, China managed to grow you know, 8%, 10%, 14%, tr truly astronomical levels. Uh, you know, since then, 2015, 6%, 6%, 6%. And uh, its, its economy you know, in 2020 was, was 2%. Now, it's, is it aiming for that 5%, 6% GDP target? And yeah, I mean, how do, how do you think that China's GDP will be over the shorter term, and I suppose now we can also incorporate the more cyclical factors uh, as well as the structural. That China is, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, right now emerging from a recession. So growth, almost by definition, is going to be strong because it's coming from a low base. Yeah, the it's not just the low base; it's a partial revival of consumption. The government has targeted growth this year of five percent. I think it'll be closer to six percent than to five percent. But I, you know, I would caution that doesn't mean that it solved its problem. Remember that in 2020, the first year of, 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 of COVID, uh, growth was around 3%, and, and most of that growth was bad growth. The, the healthy growth uh, 
uh, what they call high quality growth was probably ne- was certainly negative in 2020, consumption, exports, and business investment. Um, but because of that contraction in consumption, we got a partial recovery in 2021. So you'll remember in 2021, growth was close to 8%. And more importantly, most of that was good growth. The two years together weren't great, but the first year was terrible and the second year was much better. We saw that again in 2022. Growth was around 3%, of which high quality growth, the real growth in the economy, was probably around 1%, 1.5%. Most of it was the kind of growth they don't want, driven by non-productive investment. But as a result, this year, we're going to see a partial recovery of the contraction in consumption last year. And so that'll drive up growth, but it's just a one-shot thing. It'll happen this year by probably by the end of the third quarter, beginning of the fourth quarter, it will wear away. And so next year, we're right back to the same old problem that China's always faced, which is its excess reliance on investment and, uh, and the underperformance of consumption to drive growth. After last year's interest rate surge, income has made a comeback, and VanEck has the ETFs to help bring income to your portfolio. You can check out VanEck's wide range of income-focused ETFs using their Income Investing Yield Monitor, where you can search by yield, duration, and expense to find the ETF that fits your needs. With the Yield Monitor, you can effortlessly track monthly fixed income ETF category flows, yields, total returns, and more. To access VanEck's Income Investing Yield Monitor, go to vanek.com slash forward guidance. Now the disclosures. Investing risk includes principal loss. Visit vanek.com to read a prospectus before investing. Vanek ETFs are distributed by Vanek Securities Corporation, a wholly owned subsidiary of Vanek Associates Corporation. Thanks, and let's get back to the interview. And Professor, in, in America, we saw that people working from home and you know, lockdowns, either enforced by the government or just uh, you know, consumer behavior, they wanted to, to stay home drove a domestic uh, consumption boom because people, you know, everyone was ordering goods on Amazon. Were you seeing that in China where, you know, Ch- Chinese nationals, residents, they they were working from home, locked in, quarantined. And were they ordering stuff on Alibaba or Pinduoduo? Or did you not see that domestic consumption boom that we had in, in the, the West? Yeah, that exploded. But, you know, I think there is this perception that China is this sort of high tech advanced economy. It's not. It's a middle income economy. Most jobs involve, you know, pushing wheelbarrows or delivering food on, on, on motorbikes. It's not high tech stuff. So when the economy closed in, in, in 2020 and, and, and again in 2022, most small businesses collapsed, you know, service businesses. I work a lot in the music industry. I, I, I started a, a, an indie label. Um, and so I know a lot of people in the music industry and many of them were doing you know, gig work and all of that collapsed. None of them made any money. So of course they weren't able to spend. And that was the problem. You know, there are three reasons why people don't spend money. One reason is because their income goes down. And that's not going to come back until their income goes up. Um, and, and we saw a reduction in income and a rise in unemployment. The second reason is the uncertainty. When you become nervous, you react. And, and this is not true just in China, but in the US, Europe, Japan, everywhere. You react by spending less and saving more in case of trouble. Um, and that's probably not going to change for many more years. We'll need many years of stability before people relax again and start spending their income. And then the third reason you stop spending is because you, you're locked up at home. You, you know, it's very hard to spend money. That's going to come back. That's what we will expect to come back this year, that, that component of savings. But total savings uh, is still going to be down from before the, pa- I'm sorry, up from before the pandemic or I should say total consumption, will be down from before the pandemic because many of the reasons for the reduction in consumption haven't really been resolved, right? So if the main reason you didn't go out and get a haircut is that you were not allowed to leave your home, once you're allowed to leave your home, you're going to rush out and get a haircut. That'll boost consumption. But that's a one-shot thing. You're not going to, you know, you're, you're, you're not going to permanently increase your level of haircuts. Reading news about China, particularly on 
websites and newspapers that are affiliated with the the, the states or sort of you know say, saying the message that that the government uh, is, is going with are talking so much about consumption. Oh, there's a consumption boom coming. Oh my God, over the Chinese New Year, all of these people flew all over the country. Isn't this amazing? Uh, to what degree do you think you know that that will occur? Can the Chinese government sort of uh, influence consumers just to, to buy more. I mean, if the, you know, you see an ad of Ch- Chinese officials saying you should go and travel and, and visit your aunt in you know Guangzhou, right. are people going to do it? You know, I mean, how do you think the success of that? Yeah, they call it consumption upgrading. They're also telling shops to stay open later at night. They're having consumption festivals, etc. But you know, think about your own consumption patterns. At the end of the day, what you probably do, what most people do, is you have an income. Out of that income, you know you have to save a certain amount for retirement, for emergency medical, for whatever, and then you spend the rest. And so if I come to you and tell you, you know, guess what? All the shops are going to stay open two hours later. Go out and spend more. Well, you're not going to spend more. You still have the same budget constraint. You may go shopping later than you normally do, so you'll spend more at night and less during the day but you're not going to spend more because your constraint is your, 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 your budget, your income. Um, so there's really only two ways to increase the consumption share of GDP. One is to increase the household income share, reduce business profits, reduce government revenues, and, and give more to ordinary people. And the other way is to increase debt. So tell the banks to lend more money to consumers. And there's always people who want to borrow in any country. It's just a question of will will the banks lend to them? Tell the banks you got to lend to them. But the problem with the latter way is that that's already happened. Chinese household debt levels are very high. Relative to income, they're higher than in the US. How is it possible that Chinese household debt is so high at the same time that Chinese household savings is so high? If you're saving all this money, you can pay off debt. Why are you taking on the debt? Well, the mistake is to think that savings are what households do. Uh, Savings are what households and businesses and governments do. So in the U.S., what we've seen, for example, is with the rise of income inequality, household income has gone down. And uh, the savings of the rich has gone up and the savings of the rich has been recycled by lending to households. So household debt goes up. In China, what happens is if you lower household income, then then savings go up, not because households save more, but because households consume less. And so businesses get more, uh, get a higher share, governments get a higher share, which they save. So what really matters in China is the distribution of income. But if you look at household debt compared to household income, in China, it's actually higher than in the U.S. If you look at household debt relative to GDP in China, it's lower than the U.S. And that's just a mathematical way of saying that the household income share of GDP in China is much lower than the household income share of GDP in, in, in the U.S., You know, Jack, let me continue that because I think that's very counterintuitive and a lot of people don't understand it. When you think about Chinese businesses are so competitive and, and, you know, globally, and we think, oh, well, that probably has to do with, you know, this tremendous manufacturing efficiency and, 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 and hard work and thriftiness and all that stuff. But no, it's got nothing to do with that. Countries that are more competitive, China, uh, 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 Japan, Germany, the Netherlands, South Korea, it's all the same, are more competitive uh, mainly because households retain a lower share of what they produce. So basically, they're more competitive because they're subsidized, and subsidies have to be paid for. And if there's only three sectors in the economy, government, households, and businesses, subsidies to businesses and the government must be paid for from the household sector. So you have this mechanism that transfers income from ordinary people to businesses and governments, and that makes businesses more competitive because they're more subsidized, but that reduces domestic demand. So that's the real problem. If you want to reverse that, I can tell you exactly what to do. It's nothing very complicated. You have to reverse those, the direction of those transfers. You have to give households more. But remember, if the reason Chinese manufacturers are so competitive 
is because of all of these direct and hidden subsidies, take them away and reverse them, and they suddenly become very uncompetitive. And that's a very a painful process through which to go. That's probably why Japan, for example, has been talking about raising consumption for 30, 40 years, and they haven't been able to do that because implicitly it means undermining your manufacturing competitiveness. Right. And Professor, how does the Chinese financial um, system work with the banking sector? Because I, you know, in, in America, you know, banks privately owned, they make loans. If there's an issue, sometimes the government gets involved. There are you know, government agencies, Federal Reserve, Federal Home Loan Bank, uh, Fannie Mae, that assist in various ways that are actually you know, uh, quite, uh, uh, you know, they play a very active role. So it, that kind of countervates the sort of private markets narrative, but they are privately owned. In China, how many of the uh, banks are state owned? And when you say all of this debt uh, is, is funding uh, this investments, whether it's productive or, or unproductive or lending to the consumers, how many of that is, is via the banks versus capital markets? I know in, you know in America, Apple, you know, the computer company is going to borrow money. It's you know, likely not going to do it from a bank. It's going to issue a bond. And I know the capital markets in America are more than in Europe. Europe has it, but it's not as much. What, how much of China is banks versus capital markets, uh, state-owned bank versus private bank? And then how does the central bank, the People's Bank of China, PBOC, how does that play in all that? Well, there are two really fundamental differences between the financial system in China and the U.S. The most obvious, but the less important, is that China is much more of a banking system than it is of a market system. So in the U.S., last time I looked, things may have changed, but banks represented roughly 30 percent of financing, bonds 30 percent, and, um, and equity around 40 percent, something like that. In China, banks represent something like 90% of the financing. Um, it's, it's a heavily bank system. Yeah. Germany's like that. Japan's like that. There are many countries like that. But the real difference, I would argue, is that it's not a market banking system. It's an administered banking system, by which I mean, you know, Japan in the 1980s, we called it window guidance. So in the U.S., if the Fed wants uh, banks to expand their lending, it typically does so by engineering a reduction in interest rates, and that causes more demand for loans and banks expand their lending. In China or in Japan in the 1980s, that's not how it worked. Literally, the regulators would call the banks and say, expand your lending to the automobile sector by 10 percent, expand your lending to the household sector by 5 percent, expand your lending to steel companies by, you know, whatever. Um, interest rates didn't matter. The purpose of interest rates is the amount of transfer between net lenders, which are household depositors, and net borrowers, right? So it's a very, very different banking system. It's administered. The regulators decide what the banks are going to do, basically. In the aggregate, individual banks can move around a bit. But if the regulators want automobile loans to go up by 10%, automobile loans will go up by 10%. And roughly how many of the Chinese banks are state-owned enterprises? It's not such an important distinction, and it's always hard to tell. So, for, for example, the big four banks are partially privatized, and yet their chairmen are determined by Beijing, right? So Beijing actually decides who the leaders are, and they're shuffled between the Ministry of Finance, the central bank, and the big four banks. Then you have a smaller group of, um, of, of commercial banks that are largely privately owned, and then below that, you have a lot of much smaller banks, some privately owned, some owned by cooperatives, some owned by local governments. Um, but they're really, it doesn't make sense to think of a distinction. The banking system is heavily regulated and heavily controlled. So I think most of us don't really think about the difference between privately owned banks and state owned banks. There are differences, but they're not major differences. Right. And so the government, you said Beijing, uh, controls so much of the lending. Oh, lend this much to steel, this much to, to real estate. When people talk about the uh, crackdown on real estate, how much of it, it what was Beijing telling banks to curb lending? And then was, was that one of the three so-called red lines? Well, the three red lines all had to do with restrictions on lending. Uh, the, the, 
the real estate market both soared and collapsed largely because of uh, of regulatory reasons. So, um, you know, for a long time, uh, real estate prices only went up and local governments became more and more dependent on real estate in order to fund all of their spending. And so this mentality developed that China could never allow real estate prices to come down because that would significantly undermine the ability of local governments to fund these huge amounts of spending. And when everyone believes that, if you're a bank, you should lend as much as possible to the real estate sector because prices are never going to go down. And if prices never go down, you can never lose money. Even if the person you lend it to goes bankrupt, you seize his land, uh, liquidate it, and, and you're fully repaid. So it becomes this heavily self It's a self fulfilling prophecy, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, but once the central bank, or not so much the central bank, but the regulators made clear that they thought real estate prices had gotten out of hand, and as a share of GDP, Chinese residential real estate is almost certainly the highest in the world, once they decided that and said you can no longer borrow, that sort of caused the whole thing to collapse because the real estate sector was so heavily leveraged. The, the profit model of the real estate sector was borrow as much as you can. Don't worry about the risk because it's very easy to refinance. And in a worst case scenario, you can sell the land at a higher price than you bought it for, so you're fine. The moment you stop that game, the whole thing started to come down. And that's created real problems with the ability of local governments to finance themselves and uh, people who own apartments are worried about prices going down, et cetera. So now there's an attempt to stabilize the real estate market. But even if they're able to stabilize it, and I'm not sure they can, that means stabilizing it at prices which would still be the highest in the world relative to GDP. And uh, I don't think, I mean, the historical evidence suggests that when prices are so out of whack, one way or the other, they're going to come down. You can't stabilize them. And how severe of an impact do you think the you know, implosion, de- detonation of the Chinese real estate bubble, if, if we can call it that, uh, will have on the Chinese economy. When the U.S. real estate bubble popped in 2006, 7, 8, it had disastrous consequences. Yeah, you know, the real estate sector is always a very large part of the economy. And the problem with real estate bubbles is when they deflate, it's always really painful. In the case of China, it's more extreme because in the U.S., maybe the real, it depends how you count it, the real estate sector might have been 10 to 15% of GDP. In China, it was double that. In the U.S., uh, residential property may be, I don't know, 120% of GDP. In China, it sort of peaked out at 350%. Um, the, the, the real estate component of the typical portfolio of savings in most of the world is around 25, 30%. In China, it was up to 60, maybe even 70%. So the the whole Chinese economy was far more leveraged to real estate than even other economies. And every every economy is heavily leveraged to the real estate sector, but in China, much more so. So, you know, that's one of the reasons why many people think if if you want to understand what is likely to happen to China, you should probably look at Japan post-1990, 1991 as a possible model. When people hear this, and you know, when I was growing up, this is my first thing. I heard that, oh, the U.S. has so much debt because it owes so much to China, which is accurate on a government level. Because U.S. runs a trade deficit, China has recycled a lot of those into U.S. Treasury. So China, the Chinese and Chinese government owns a lot of U.S. government debt. But on the private sector level, corporate borrowing and household borrowing – the debt in China is is quite large. Is that fair to say? Yeah, the thing in China is that it's, you know, the distinction between private debt and public debt is much less important than it is in the U.S. because moral hazard underpins the banking system. So basically, I think of it as, as everything is directly or indirectly government debt, uh, particularly since most of it goes through the banking system. And if you default on your loans to the banks, then the banks default and the banks have to be bailed out by the government. So effectively, they're a contingent liability of the government. It's mostly one way or another, it's mostly government debt. But they're, they're, the debt levels are very, very high. You know, that's part of the problem. We've, we saw this in the 1920s. We've seen this before. Uh, 
when you have these huge trade unbalances, they're bad for both sides. The, the huge U.S. deficit has to be met with rising debt because the U.S. deficit basically is a reduction of domestic demand. Part of domestic demand goes abroad. And in order to prevent the economy from slowing, either the fiscal government has to borrow uh, or households have to borrow. And so it's between the Fed and Washington as to who's going to borrow. But somehow or the other, you need rising debt to keep growth from slowing. In China, you have, in, in many ways, a problem that's opposite, but also very similar. And that is with domestic demand so weak, the only way China can resolve its domestic production is through a growing trade surplus. And if China was Singapore, it could get away with it. But large economies can't do that or with growing investment. And because more and more of this investment is non-productive, that means China has to resolve its domestic demand deficiency with rising debt. So it's not an accident that you see debt levels on both sides of the imbalances rise very quickly. That's always what we've seen. What we're seeing today is no different. All right, you cover that in your book, uh, Trade Wars Are Class Wars. I think you know folks viewing this in America might be familiar with the, the sense that um, U.S. reliance on importing goods from China led to uh, lower uh, employment in the manufacturing sector, and you know the, uh, jobs got shipped overseas. In China, what is that? Is what are the class implications of this? You know, the China jo joining the WTO and this huge boom in global trade that began in the you know late 1990s, early 1990s. Well, the, the basic argument that Matthew Klein and I make in, in trade wars and uh, our class wars, and there's a bunch of arguments, but I would say the, 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 the two most counterintuitive things that we point out, first off, is that when people say that the U.S. runs a deficit because Americans say very little, they don't understand the balance of payments. Countries that have totally open capital accounts cannot control the relationship between investment and savings. And so we invert that. We say because the U.S. has a big deficit, the U.S. has a big deficit because the rest of the world needs some place to dump all of their savings. So the U.S. must run a deficit, and that forces down American savings. So we, have, we, we say the causality of the argument most people make is completely backwards. It's not that the U.S. has a trade deficit because Americans say very little. Americans have to say very little because the U.S. is running a big trade deficit driven by the excess savings of the rest of the world. So that's one argument we make. The other argument we make, uh, more to your point, is that trade imbalances, trade conflicts, we think of them as conflicts between surplus countries and deficit countries, between the U.S. and Europe. Uh, I'm sorry, between the U.S. and China. And what we try to show in the book, and I think, you know, when you think about the balance of payments arithmetic, the balance of payments logic, it's very clear. It's that it's not that one country benefits and the other country suffers. What ends up happening is that certain groups, and they tend to be the same groups in both countries benefit, uh, and other groups suffer. So what we argue is that China's trade surplus benefits the government and the elites, particularly the owners of movable capital, because it's built on the backs of very low wages for, for Chinese workers. And we argue the U.S. deficits, which benefit Wall Street, which benefit, weirdly enough, the foreign affairs establishment, and again, owners of movable capital, is built on the backs of small businesses, producers, and farmers in the U.S. So that's why we say the trade wars are not really national wars. They're class wars. Certain sectors of the economy in both countries, primarily workers, the middle class, small businesses, suffer because of these imbalances. And then certain sectors, the elites in both countries, benefit because of these imbalances. And I think that's probably the strongest message we try to get through in that book. Right. So as you say, the U.S. has an open capital account. Anyone can move money easily yeah. you know, in, to, in to and out of the U.S., U.S. treasuries. Uh, China, which you know, I think has a closed capital account. What does that What does that mean? Uh, is it a lot harder to get money in and out of China? Why does the government uh, have that policy? To what To what aim is are the sort of capital controls in, in China? 
it's much harder to get money uh, uh, moving in and out in China. And the reason is because the Chinese aren't befuddled by, you know, the sort of bizarre faith Americans have that in order to maximize growth, you have to allow basically Wall Street to have maximum freedom. Um, there's no argument in favor. There's really no legitimate argument in favor of removing capital controls. Uh, you know, back at Bretton Woods, Bretton Woods was a negotiation between Keynes representing England and Harry Dexter White representing the United States. And clearly they differed on many things. But one of the things they both agreed was that there's no justification for the free flow of capital. Um, a small amount of capital flows is a good thing if it flows from less productive countries to more productive countries. In other words, from rich countries to developing countries. But they argued that most capital flows were really speculative, were not driven by productivity, were driven by other reasons. But immediately the economy had to adjust to these capital flows. So I would argue that countries like the United States, England, Canada, Australia, they're, they're sort of embedded with this ideology of free capital flows, which is quite new. Uh, uh, as recently as 1983, the U.S. had capital controls. But then we decided in our, in our wisdom or in our stupidity that what you really needed was to liberate capital flows as much as possible and maximize the, the, the influence and power of international banks. And once that happened, uh, the rest of the world, because they became more competitive by repressing savings, that pushed up their savings rate, which they couldn't invest at home. So when you run a surplus, you need to acquire assets abroad. And what's the best place to acquire assets? Well, for legal reasons, for flexibility, for financial reasons, it's the so-called Anglophone economies, the US, the UK, uh, Canada, and Australia. So it's not a surprise that 60, 70, 80% of all of the excess savings in the world goes to those four countries, even though they don't need the capital. And of course, that also means that 60 to 80% of all of the trade deficits in the world belong to those four countries. That's not a coincidence. It's a necessary component. If the U.S. is running a, a capital deficit, if it's importing money from abroad, which understands what that means. Many people say the U.S. is exporting dollar bills and getting goods. That's total bullshit. What the U.S. Ex what the US is exporting is claim on American assets, real estate, stocks, bonds, farmland, equity, in exchange for goods. And that's what creates that imbalance. Foreigners buy American assets because if you have excess money, whether you're an oligarch or a drug dealer or a central bank or a middle class saver, the best place to put your excess money is in the U.S. But by doing that, you force the U.S. to run deficits, which undermines U.S. workers, U.S. businesses, U.S. middle classes. Um, you know, I think that's the really important point to understand. These trade imbalances are bad for both sides of the equation, but they're very hard to get out of. Right. And so uh, China may be running out of uh, profitable, productive investment opportunities domestically, but there are a lot of investment opportunities abroad, you know, not just in the United States. So China has done uh, something called the Belt and Road Initiative. Oh, let's lend to emerging market uh, nations to build railroads, build ports. Uh, how successful have, have these programs been and yeah, are they a viable path forward for sort of marshalling the surplus excess savings that we've been talking about? Well, initially, you're exactly right. That was one of the big purposes of BRI is we have all these excess savings. We've got to invest it. Let's invest it in developing countries. But understand that only a very tiny share goes to developing countries. Most of it goes to advanced countries. It's much safer to put it there. Now, um, China made, you know, a lot of people talk about debt trap diplomacy and all this other, you know, uh, paranoid stuff. That's not what really happened. China did the same thing the U.S. did in the 1920s when it first started to go out and lend heavily to Latin America. What the Soviet Union did in the 1950s, what Japan did in the 1980s is because it didn't really understand lending to developing countries. 
it thought it was very easy and, it, and, and loans to developing countries expanded very rapidly. Now, before I moved to China, I worked on Wall Street. I used to trade and run capital markets specializing in Latin America. So I know Latin America reasonably well. And it was very clear that Chinese loans were expanding most quickly to countries like Ecuador, Venezuela, Argentina, which were countries that nobody wanted to lend to for pretty good reason. They were very risky countries. Um, but like the US in the 1920s, like the Soviets in the 1950s, the Japanese in the 1980s, they thought it was quite easy and they were quite successful at it. Um, but in every case, you learn at some point that it's not that easy. And in China, that happened in 2015 with the huge problem in Venezuela. That caused a real shock in China. And you'll notice that before 2015, lending to developing countries goes up. Since then, it's come down very sharply. China wants to reduce its lending to developing countries because it increasingly recognizes in Sri Lanka, in Zaire, in, in Pakistan, that it's very hard to get the money back. So that's not really a useful outlet. Um, it would be good if this excess uh, savings went to developing countries because it would generate growth there. But the problem is it's not coming back. And these loans that China makes to uh, foreign countries, advanced countries, as you say, as well as emerging frontier market countries, how many of them are denominated in yuan versus denominated in dollars? And how relevant is that to the global dollar as the global reserve currency de-dollarization narrative, which I know you have a lot of thoughts about? Well, by definition, China cannot invest its surpluses in, in yuan or in renminbi. Uh, you can only invest your surpluses in a foreign country. Um, and, you know, so the real question is, will it be dollars? Will it be, you know, rupees? Will it be Brazilian or Aish? Will it be, you know, whatever? And the fact is, for all the talk, it has to be dollars. And the way you can tell, Jack, it's very easy. Look at the surplus countries and look at the deficit countries. By definition, the surplus countries are investing their surpluses in the deficit countries. And what you'll see is that 70 to 80 percent of the deficit countries are the four Anglophone economies throw in Europe. And it's probably like 80 to 90 percent. So that means by definition, the surplus countries collectively are investing in the rich countries of the world, the U.S., Europe and the and the Anglophone economies. Um, there's no way of getting around the arithmetic. So one of the things that happens is that, you know, we all look at uh, uh, the PBOC, a holding of, of treasuries, and we see they're coming down slowly, but they're coming down year after year. And everyone says, wow, the Chinese are not investing in the U.S. Well, that's nonsense, because first of all, much of the increase in reserves are, are happening outside of the central bank. They're held, they're held by the state banks, and much of that is in dollars. And secondly, even as China is selling U.S. treasuries, it's replacing it with U.S. agencies or other U.S. assets. So if you just look at Chinese holding of treasuries, that's not Chinese holding of dollars. That's just Chinese holding of treasuries. The total dollar amount is going up. The other thing you have to understand, this gets a little bit complicated, but let's say the Russians decide to hold their large surpluses in renminbi. The way the balance of payments works is if the Russians take $100 worth of surpluses and invest it in renminbi, China can only respond in one of two ways. Either the China surplus must decline by $100, or Chinese acquisition of foreign assets must go up by $100. And what we're seeing is that Chinese acquisitions of foreign assets are going up by $100. So when people see China investing in, in, I'm sorry, Russia investing in China and saying that means the dollar is being used less, not really. What it means is that instead of the Russians investing in dollars, the Chinese are investing in dollars on their behalf. They're intermediating those flows. And so we see renminbi go up and we get all panicky and, and crazy. Uh, by the way, let me add one other thing, Jack. Um, many people think that abandoning the dollar would be terrible for the U.S. and great for China and Iran and Russia. They have it absolutely backwards. If the world gave up use of the dollar and Washington should force the world to give up use of the dollar, the American trade deficit would immediately contract. 
and the surplus of all of those countries would immediately contract. That would add demand to the U.S. economy and subtract demand from those economies. It would actually benefit the U.S. and hurt those other countries. That's why these countries have been talking about replacing the dollar basically since the 1970s, and they've never been able to do it. Um, you know, the ones who really should be forcing the world to replace the dollars is us. Americans should demand that foreigners stop acquiring American assets. So is it realistic at all that uh, the Chinese yuan becomes the next global reserve currency and Chinese leadership in Beijing, do they have that ambition at, at all? No, I think what they would like to do is to have more trade denominated in a system in which the U.S. cannot turn it off. But ultimately, what matters to trade is not what currency you denominate the trade in. For example, if you want to sell me, you know, whatever, a pair of shoes, um, we can do it in dollars. But if you have a smartphone with the right app and I have a smartphone with the right app, we can do it in Malaysian ringgit. We can do it in euros. We can do it in any currency we both agree on. It doesn't really matter. What really matters is if I buy the shoes from you, what do you do with the money? And at the end of the day, what you're going to do with the money is you're going to buy U.S. assets. And that's what's important. Professor, t t uh, tell us about the Chinese stock market and its relationship with uh, growth and real estate. You know, the U.S., uh, you know, many excess savings go into the stock market as well as real estate. Uh, in China, is it accurate to say that, you know, a lot more goes into real estate as well as you know, bank financing of real estate than in equities? And also, do you, can you comment on the fact that over the past, let's say, decade, uh, the China has grown a lot, but the stock market returns are, you know, uh, quite meager? Yeah. Well, that's been a big concern for investors for a long time. There's almost no correlation between the performance of the stock market and the performance of the economy or uh, uh, corporate profits. Uh, it's a very speculative market. It goes up and down, largely on government signaling, changes in underlying liquidity. Uh, so in 2015, when the government made very clear that they wanted the stock market to go up, it went up 150% in a year. And then when they made clear that it had gone up too much and they were starting to get nervous, it dropped 60% in a couple of months. By the way, up 150, down 60 means you're right back to where you started from. So you get these huge swings in the market, largely based on investor interpretation of government signaling. It's not a, it's not a, a, a market driven by, by fundamentals. Mind you, I would say in the last 10 years, it's hard to argue that the U.S. market is driven by fundamentals either. Um, but at least from time to time, it is. Um, but what's really important in China is the, is the real estate market as an asset market. The stock market is quite small in China relative to the size of the economy. It's not that important. It matters at the margin. Prices go up. A few people feel richer. Prices go down. A few people feel poorer. But it's not like in the U.S. Okay, uh, thanks for explaining that, uh, Professor. You mentioned the People's Bank of China and liquid, you know, adding liquidity, taking liquidity away. I've you know in interviewed folks, I mean, you know, experts on liquidity who say global liquidity is actually going to resurge this year because the Bank of Japan is here to save the world. The People's Bank of China is here to save the world. How important are those flows? You know, when the Federal Reserve does quantitative easing, you know, as it does in March 2020, extend dollar swap lines to you know many so many countries. An immense uh, research in global liquidity. You know, my question for you is: Number one, can the People's Bank of China you know, increase global liquidity? And number two is: Are they? Will they this year? Well, they'll increase domestic liquidity. Already, debt levels are growing. In the first quarter, debt levels grew faster than they ever have before in Chinese history. Um, but um, there is very little contagion between the Chinese markets and the international markets because of capital controls. So when you had you know, the banking crisis in the US and in Europe this year, that had almost no impact on China. But the flip side of that is if you have a banking crisis in China or an expansion of liquidity in China, that will have very limited impact on the rest of the world through financial means. Now, it could have an impact through the real economy. So for example, if you saw a massive expansion in liquidity in China, that would probably not cause consumption to rise. That would probably cause production to rise. 
because most of the expansion tends to be on the supply side, not on the demand side. So that would cause the Chinese current account surplus to rise. And as the Chinese current account surplus rose, China would have to would have to uh, uh, convert more of that into the acquisition of foreign assets. So you would see an increase in foreign liquidity through an increase in the current account. But it's not a direct thing. It's not from financial system to financial system. It's from the Chinese financial system to the current account and from the Chinese current account to the U.S. financial system. It's much more indirect. Thank you, Professor. I've got got two uh, final questions for you. My my first is on the shorter term cyclical, let's say, over the next years. Setting aside the structural worries you have about the Chinese growth and growth model going forward, uh, I think is it, perhaps it's accurate to say now that the U.S. growth is slowing. You're probably entering a recession. Europe growth is is you know not looking great as well. However, China is emerging from a re- recession. You know, man-made, whatever. Uh, so China is sort of the engine of, of global growth in 2023. And although you're not optimistic on, on long-term Chinese growth prospects, you actually are more optimistic. It sounds like uh, over the next year than the Chinese government is, because Chinese government aiming for five percent. You said they could do six percent. So, I, I mean, yeah. What do you think the the next year will look like economically? The consequences of if you're right, you know, China is you know once again sort of leading the torch uh, for the world as it did in 2009. Well, not you have to be very careful about that. First of all, I think China will get, as I said, closer to six percent than to five percent. I don't think that makes me more optimistic than the government. If you look at provincial uh, uh, GDP growth targets on a weighted average basis, they're around 5.5, 5.6. So I think many people in China believe it's going to be well above 5%. I think they picked a low target in order to beat it. Um, but I wouldn't call China the growth engine of the world. I would say that it'll be arithmetically the highest component of GDP growth. But the way China interacts with the world, the way any country interacts with the world is through its balance of payments. So what really matters is what happens to the Chinese balance of payments. If the Chinese maintain very, very high trade surpluses, then they will actually be sucking growth out of the rest of the world. And if their trade surplus contracts, that will add demand to the rest of the world and, and add, uh, uh, demand to the, uh, add growth to the rest of the world. So what really matters is not how quickly China grows. What really matters for the world is not how quickly China grows, but the evolution of China's current account surplus. And I think it will probably remain pretty high this year. It's at, it's at world record levels, and I don't think it's coming down very rapidly. Right. And because China is a production rather than consumer-led economy, if you have a Chinese boom this year or a relative uh, boom in, in China, if I gather what from what you're saying, that is not going to necessarily cause a boom in d- demand for U.S. goods. Yeah, we're going to see, uh, 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 I hope, a, a boom in consumption in China, pretty strong consumption. Um, and that'll be good for the world. But I think it's important to recognize it's not the growth rate in China that matters. It's the relative growth between production and consumption, which shows up in the trade account. That's what matters to the rest of the world. And even that's very uneven because very rapid Chinese growth with a rapid growth in the trade surplus could be bad for the world. But if it causes commodity prices to surge, then it's good for commodity producers and bad for commodity importers. So it's a very uneven impact on the rest of the world. If you're Brazil, you would love to see a massive investment-driven growth in China which China doesn't want to do, that would be bad for China and bad for the world, but great if you're Brazil, because it would cause iron ore prices to go up. Right. Okay. That that makes sense. uh, Professor, people, you're very active on Twitter. People should check you out at at Michael X Pettis. That is your your handle, as well as your um, multiple uh, blogs on the Carnegie Endowment, as as well as your book, uh, Trade Wars Are Class Wars. Professor, if you could sum up your views of of China's longer-term uh, growth prospects and just just tie it back. I mean, uh, how high do you think the, the growth will will be? And you know, why is it? Do you think that the sort of uh, China will have very low growth and it will, will surprise on on the downside? And uh, you know, I've heard you say you know, China long term growth two percent, three percent. So it would be great you know to get you on the on the record for that. As well as I've heard you you say in previous interviews that you're pessimistic on Chinese growth, but history says that even the pessimists are not pessimistic enough. 
Well, yeah, you know, I mean, imagine if you had predicted in the year uh, 1990 that for the next 20 years, Japan would grow at 2%. You would have been laughed at, right? 2% is ridiculous. There's no way it could possibly happen. In fact, it turned out to be half a percent. Um, By the late 1970s, early 80s, people knew there was a problem in, in Latin America and in Brazil, et cetera. Not one of them would have predicted how difficult that problem was. Uh, look at American history in the, 19, in the early 30s. We knew there was a problem, but no one predicted the Great Depression. So we tend to underestimate the, the, the boom phase of the investment cycle and underestimate the contractionary phase. So, so that's why I say we should be prepared for the outcome to be much worse than we think it is. But, you know, my, my reasoning is very simple. China invests right now between 42 to 44 percent of its GDP. It's been doing that for more than 20 years. In fact, it reached as high as 47 percent. This is an extraordinary number. The world invests about 25 percent. High investing countries invest around 30 to 33 percent, not as long as China has for shorter periods, but that's what they invest. So if you just do the math, uh, it, uh, at some point, China has to stop probably 10, 15 years ago, but certainly it can't continue this high level of investment forever. It must bring it down. So if you do the math, you'll see that as the investment share comes down, there's only two ways to balance that, right? Either consumption growth must pick up speed while investment's coming down, theoretically possible, but it's never happened before or consumption growth slows a little as investment growth slows a lot, in which case GDP growth slows a lot. That's just arithmetic. So when people say China's gonna grow at 5% for the next 15 years, that assumes that for the next 15 years, they're going to keep investment at this impossibly high level, which is almost impossible to conceive, or somehow they're gonna get consumption to grow much faster than it has in recent years, to grow at six or 7%. And it's very hard to imagine how they will do that as they're bringing investment down. So I'm saying it's just logical. This is just the way the, you know, uh, an an economic adjustment works. All the historical precedents show that the investment, you know, miracle has been followed by a much more difficult adjustment than we expected. And the reasoning for that is that as you bring investment growth down, either GDP growth drops or you must bring consumption growth up. And those are your only alternatives. Super interesting. Professor Pettis, thank you so much for joining us, sharing your your insights on China. And thank you, everyone, for watching. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Forward Guidance, the program you just enjoyed, hopefully, can be viewed on YouTube at BlockWorks Macro or heard as a podcast on Apple Podcast and Spotify. Episodes are typically released on Apple and Spotify a few hours before they air on YouTube. Please leave a review on Apple Podcast if you feel so inclined. Also, you can get 10% off to Permissionless 2023 and BlockWorks Research using code GUIDANCE10. Thanks again and be well.